Obviously, Li Denghui plays a vital role in the uh, in the Taiwan's process of uh, democratization. Uh, and uh, night in the year of 1996 is a really significant uh, for the history of the Chinese people. Uh, it's the first time a national leader is elected by popular vote, and that is really significant. And uh, the other thing is, uh, I think, the significance is that uh, there are very few uh, change, changeover of the power from authoritarian uh, leadership to a democratic leadership was uh, without bloodshed. And that was uh, a very rare case in any part of the world. And that's, that's why I think uh, uh, you you have many international press coverage for in during the process of a uh, changeover and uh, since uh, Li is also uh, as you may know who concerned about the Taiwan situation Taiwan is very very much politically polarized so and uh, the uh, the political polarization is color coded uh, we have uh, pen blue and uh, pen green. Pen Green is pro-independent, Pen Blue is pro, I wouldn't say unification now, but, but friendlier to China. And uh, they are they are probably about equally, uh, I would say probably each camp has uh, probably 10 to 15 percent diehard fans. And uh, probably 20 to 25 percent are in either the camp and uh, in the middle probably 20 percent or so. So anything, whatever is leaning toward a particular camp, you have people for it and against it. For the every night, uh, every evening in the uh, political talk shows, they are pro uh, the uh, pro blue and they are pro green uh, political talk shows even today. So. Uh, for Li Denghui, those who either like him or hate him. <laughs> so we, when we produced this program, uh, documentary, it took us two years. We actually were wor working on thin ice. We were very careful in producing it. We know this is going to, he is such a controversial figure. And uh, so we were very, very careful. And actually, uh, we listed uh, 100 people that we wanted to interview, and uh, half of them turned us down. And uh, they didn't want to talk about him. Uh, and uh, some of them only willing to talk off camera, off record, just to give us background information. Some of them were quite valuable. But uh, as, so from this figure, as you can tell, the counter the controversy, controversial nature of the person. So, now, well, I'm welcome to any questions any that uh, I can share with you. Okay, uh, Dr. Phil. Uh, <laughs> uh, one question I wanted to ask. One of the things we discovered in, in uh, yesterday's Song Wei yeah. uh, film was that through making the documentary, you discovered some new things that yeah, no yeah. one knew about. Yeah. And what, what were the big discoveries from, from this film? Uh, we we didn't have those uh, exact uh, historical documentary as we revealed uh, yesterday as uh, Song Meiling, but uh, because Li Denghui is already a contemporary person, not unlike Song Meiling, mm -hmm. <laughs> which you can uh, is uh, on the top and hard to reach by average person, so. But I think it it is uh, overall the Chinese version is three hours. Uh, because I think we probably one of the few medium really look at him uh, in the somehow microscopic ways. So putting this uh, documentary together, I think, give us more of a clear view on what kind of who he. Uh, really is, maybe we still don't know, but uh, relatively, maybe we finally are able to understand a little bit more what kind of person and what kind of uh, time and age ha he has been through. You have a better understanding of this person. 
uh, and many people in mainland China hated him uh, very much, as you saw the interviews. But actually, uh, some of the scholars and uh, uh, after they look at the film, uh, they gain a much better understanding about Taiwan. Yeah. So I, I think that's the kind of thing, uh, that's a kind of a new thing we were able to gain through this film, rather than specific new find, historical new findings. Yeah. Yes? Um, uh, I'm Peter Graham, uh, founder of the World Company Association. Yes. <laughs> you have to choose. Okay. Uh, okay. I think firstly we need to define the age of young. <laughs> if you we are talking about really young, uh, from uh, junior to high schools, I don't think they don't really care. <laughs> Most of them, <laughs> they, are, they are the first generation digital citizen of the world. <laughs> they are not bounded by national boundaries. Okay? They are the internet citizens. So, so this doesn't concern them. But if you're talking about a little bit older, uh, those who has a little bit more interest in politics, it's in a way divided, I think which is unfortunate. I think we have very serious issue of national identity, even today. Either who you really are. Uh, when I say Chinese just a while ago, I was a little bit hesitant. Because in Taiwan, you're either Taiwanese or Chinese. You can be both. So I myself have an identity problem. I, my parents was, went from China to Taiwan in 1948, before the fall of uh, China to mainland. So I was educated as a Chinese. So I feel I was, uh, but uh, I have uh, relatives. I went to China, mainland to visit uh, with my father to visit uh, our relatives in southern China. So there are my relatives. And, uh, but it's the kind of situation when you are separated with your relatives, say, even your brother and sister for 60 years. It's probably hard to live under the same roof again. It's that kind of feeling. So I'm, I feel I'm, for myself, I feel I'm a Taiwanese, but I have the Chinese roots. So, but you know, there are uh, many more people in Taiwan that's uh, their they are their uh, their ancestors uh, were immigrated to Taiwan many generations ago, unlike me. That's the majority, and they spoke Taiwanese, <coughs> and they were a group that without voices, either under the Japanese colonial rule or earlier Chiang Kai-shek and Chiang Ching Kuo rule. So when Li Denghui was become the president. It's one of their own become the national leader. And they, can, they were able to speak out loud on their own language. And that is really the root of Li Denghui's power. And that makes many of the Taiwanese people proud. When he speak at the canal, it kind of make the country, the people of the country proud. But later it changed. So, uh, the, I, the ideology of Li Denghui kind of changed along the way. For myself, I don't think he has this idea from, right from the beginning. I think his ideology also evolved and changed over time. So uh, Li Denghui is such a powerful figure. When he promoted clearly the identity of Taiwan should be a country by itself, many people follow him. 
but those who disagree with him become uh, uh, they against him very much. So that Taiwan start being divided even until today. And the four after Li Denghui, eight years of uh, eight years of DPP administration, they are very much pro independent against China. Then afterwards, uh, KMT won over uh, the seats. Uh, won over uh, the president, mind you, become the president again. And uh, so uh, DPP still has a certain number of seats in the parliament. They were against the KMT on many fronts. And the country remained divided. So, so if, and the most of things are political sized. Uh, everything you talk about, whatever it is, there's sort of has a political undertone to it, which is unfortunate in Taiwan. So, uh, so uh, what should I say? We really have this identity problem in Taiwan, and uh, only in sports event, in international sports event, <laughs> that will unite the country. Yeah. Yeah, we would say we are Taiwanese, but uh, I, I, I would say, are, then are we a Chi are people in Taiwan Chinese? So that would depend on who you ask. Yeah, some people may be like me. I feel I, I'm a Taiwanese, but I have a Chinese roots. But some people will cut off the roots and say I'm, I'm purely Taiwanese. So, so it's complicated. Yeah. And also unfortunate. I think uh, that's uh, something. Uh, I, I think, for my personal view, I think a national leader should mediate the differences among the people mm -hmm. to make a strong country. But unfortunate, uh, that wasn't been done. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I come from Pakistan. Yeah. And uh, there are various geographical, because by virtue of its location, there are various problems, and I can understand what you were trying to debate. Uh, what I would wish you to elaborate more upon is the political dynamics in Taiwan that you even de depicted in your documentary. Um, there is rap uh, rapid frustration and aggression, both amongst the masses and amongst the uh, in the parliament as well. Um, um, I have seen horrifying situations myself, um, but what I cannot at this point understand is, are you trying to depict the past, which was, let's say, a decade or two ago, or at this present moment, is the situation the same or getting any better or worse in terms of political frustration? Because of external interference within the country's own political dynamics. Would you please elaborate on that? You, you mean the film? Yeah, both in the film, because you're trying to depict it. Yes. And you're, you're portraying an image of Taiwan to the rest of the world. So is it just the past that you're trying to show, or is the present similar to the past as well? Okay. Now, back to first, back to the purpose of the film. Okay. Uh, I think the film is mainly, uh, it stopped uh, mainly at about the year uh, 2000 after the DPP took over uh, the administration. So it's really to show, the purpose is to show the process of how Taiwan gained its democracy. And uh, Li Denghui is a figure that representative to this process. Because even people in Taiwan don't really understand every aspect of it, even when you're in it. So the purpose is really to show between, mainly between 19, what happened between 1988, after Jiang Jingguo died, until the changing of power in the year 2000. That would be the prime purpose of the film. We don't intend to uh, uh, do anything else other than to make it, uh, to make the change in a much uh, clear 
to give a much clearer picture of the change over so people of Taiwan or those who are interested in Taiwan can really understand uh, can understand what really happens of course from our interpretation <coughs> and uh, for people in Taiwan when you know the past better maybe will help you make a better choice in the future a as to the situation now we are yes we are very equally divided right now, which is unfortunate. Many things should be, many uh, laws should pass in the parliament, by the parliament for the good of the society was not, not able to be passed purely often because of blockade by ideology, political ideology, rather than any healthy, healthy debate. So that's a very unfortunate situation still last until today and uh, not, there is uh, we couldn't see any couldn't foresee any change at this point yeah so we, during the Dunway's period Taiwan was had had the economic boom now we kind of feel we are in an economic bust <laughs> and that affect everything yes uh, Michael Daniels, I'm from the uh, Danish based Taiwan Corner organization. Yeah. Yes. Uh, in, your t in the title of the documentary, documentary movie, you write the, the first Chinese democracy. Yes. Some people could argue that uh, Taiwan became a democracy because it's not purely Chinese. Uh -huh. So I wonder why. Is that <laughs> see, so see why, that's why, the why, issue. Why did you use the title the first Chinese democracy, uh, first Chinese democracy, and what is your reaction when uh, people say that it became democracy because it's not purely Chinese? I think first there are several different <laughs> definitions of Chinese. When I say Chinese, it can be also mean Han people. There is nothing related to nationality. Okay. So I would say this is more of the in the history of Chinese people. Uh, even Taiwanese is part of the Han people. Uh, that's from I don't know from archaeological definition. Okay. This type of human beings. For this type of human being, this is the first time a national leader was elected by popular vote. We can argue endlessly. Should I use the first Taiwanese democracy? But then I don't think that, or should I say, a Chinese, quote, then underline Taiwanese. <laughs> I used to work as an editor in the Chinese edition of Asia Week. It's for Chinese readers worldwide. We have underlined on many things. <laughs> like President Bush, we will say Bush. Then we'll underline the way how he said in Hong Kong Chinese, oh. what he said in mainland Chinese, what he said in Singaporean Chinese. So in the one for a period of time in the Chinese the edition of Asia Week, we have this underlying system. So it will never be an end. The discussion will never end. But I think. Uh, either it's Taiwanese or Chinese, uh, choosing national leader by popular vote is one, it, Li Denghui is the first example. So, but after all, the, the name of the country is still Republic of China. It hasn't been changed to Republic of Taiwan yet. yet. So <laughs> officially, I think, using Taiwanese, either as a nationality or as a race, of Han people, well, I, I think it, it should still be able to stand. But I know because, for example, the ratings of this documentary is not as good as Madame Jiang Taishe, because those who hate Li Denghui wouldn't even want to watch it. They just <laughs> stay away. I don't want to touch or hear or anything about this person. That's what happened, which I think is unfortunate. They should watch, and they will understand the person, and understand the differences of the two ideology better, and that will make the society better. Yes. Yes. What, what would, um, if you didn't choose journalism or media, 
what other profession would you like to reach uh, the excellence at? Oh. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow, this is quite personal. Huh? <laughs> well, actually, I, I feel fortunate that I work in media uh, because uh, I, I think one of the greatest things working in media is you can get your idea across to a bigger group than if you are not. And that, I think, is very satisfying. And I, I have been happy so far. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, my name is George Burns. I don't have any affiliation with any academic groups, but I have an interest in uh, identity and belonging. Yes. So speaking as a, an Englishman who's also British, I understand your dilemma. Yeah. Yeah. Because my passport <laughs> says British, but my characteristic says English. <laughs> <laughs> but um, what I would like to ask you, uh, watching this documentary. I've rather got the impression that uh, Lee Deng Rhee's political ambiguity is brought on by the fact that he's a bit of an opportunist, you know? He took, yeah, he, he grabbed the reefers, he come along, yeah? Uh, I don't think he planned to become president of Taiwan. No, yeah. not at all. He was uh, really, agriculture was his field, wasn't it? Yeah, until age yeah. 49. Yeah, and then yeah, so... That's almost, uh, almost 50. I mean, uh, reaching the senior citizen state. <laughs> then he was appointed by uh, Jiang Jin, <coughs> President Jiang Jingguo as a ministry, minister without portfolio right away. Would you think it would be fair that there was a few stages in his political career where he probably couldn't believe his luck? I and so. wondered what he should do with the power which has been brought to him. Yeah, so I, yeah. I, that's what I say. I think his ideology of uh, turning into... Uh, extremely pro Taiwan independent is an evolving process. And of course, there is a root within him, but I think it's an evolving process. I think he never thought that he could get involved in politics before the age of 49. Yeah. Yes. Um, just to comment on what you said, yes. Michael Ford, um, could we have a word or two about the Aborigines in Taiwan? I know they're not a big political force, but they are a force in this ethnic mixture, mm -hmm. which is you know, in some ways very impressive. Uh, what, did you ever film or build them into any of your documentaries? Okay, the Indeed Taiwan Indigenous Channel is right underneath my office. <laughs> 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 but they are part of, uh, we have a Taiwan Indigenous Channel as a part of public TV system. There are half a million uh, indigenous population in Taiwan. There are 14 official tribes. And uh, actually, most of them are more for KMT when they vote. But uh, I never really study the issue. I wouldn't really know the detail. As uh, those who of you were here yesterday, I couldn't comment on things I didn't really study. So although I have many friends, working at the uh, indigenous channel. But uh, I didn't study this particular issue you mentioned. But for most of the indigenous voters, it's linked on the KMT side. But they're certainly not half, if anything, that relates on the history and the origin of this. So oh, yeah. you mean the Polynesian and the indigenous in Taiwan? Oh, I mean the origins of Taiwan and right. so called Aboriginal. Oh, no, 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 no. I, I, but the Polynesian are, you know, these uh, Aboriginal people in the South, South Pacific, uh, like Maori in New Zealand, they had their genes, traced their genes, I think in, in, down, in, in, down in UK, Oxford or somewhere, it's all traced back to the indigenous people in Taiwan, which was quite incredible. And actually, Maori terror religion did a story about this. They sent their indigenous anchor to Taiwan, and uh, some of the language they use remained the same. So the yeah. Maori Taiwanese. Hmm? Yeah, 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 yeah. So Maori people could be Taiwanese. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that is actually quite. A f very fascinating story in that. Yes. So the claim of the Chinese first, history, first president is problematic, right? 
because they are definitely not Han people or not Chinese people. They are Austronesian <laughs> people, and they vote for the president, and the president is not purely Chinese president. Right. Well, so I don't Chinese want to go me. into that debate. Yeah, <laughs> but, and we will spend the night just debating that. Yeah. We'll become in Taiwan again. <laughs> <laughs> then, UK, you have people many ethnic backgrounds. Yeah. So if you go into that, then it will be the debate of the century. <laughs> we will take another more question, and that's it. Yes. My name is Theodore. I'm an MA in Taiwan Studies. Okay. Uh, how would you compare the extent uh, uh, Li Donghui and Xiao Jingguo's contribution to democracy? I, I think that's very. Uh, it's hard to compare. I mm. think, uh, uh, first, uh, from my understanding of Jiang Jingguo, in his earlier times, he's like, he is a, a sort of like a security chief uh, working in Taiwan, and uh, many people suffered uh, from his policies. And uh, so, uh, so he and uh, Chiang Kai-shek are considered uh, these uh, authoritarian regimes in Taiwan. But I think we have to uh, uh, contribute to the relatively fast democratization of Taiwan to the latter years of Zhang Jingguo. He was the person in power, and he was willing to give up his power. And I think that's very difficult. So he, he allowed the opposition party to rise. He opened up uh, the gate to China for people to visit their relatives. He picked Li Denghui as a vice president candidate. That was unthinkable in the Chiang Kai-shek era, era. So I think uh, for that part, Zhang Jingguo probably made up, made up some of his uh, fault he did in the earlier days. And I think Li Denghui, uh, as uh, one of the interviewees said, he is a man of strong will with strategic sense. He has a way to achieve what he wants, and he can wait. He can sit on it and wait until the time arrives then his goal will be achieved. I think there are people of different <coughs> kinds. It's hard to compare which one has a greater contribution. I think because they sit on different seats and they did different things. I think that both of them contribute to the dem democracy of Taiwan. But I wouldn't say which one did it greater. If it's not for the Zhang Jingguo, to give up open up, to give up his power, uh, to I mean, to change his attitude and open up the society, then we probably will see the democracy of Taiwan happen much later. If he chose not Li Denghui, but another, I mean, hardliner, to continue he, on his power, then the regime will probably last another decade. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have some wine. Let me remind you, we have the third session of screening. Um, I think it's 12th of December. So please come. It is Guangchang, The Rising by Jiang Weihua. It's a young uh, uh, filmmaker and it's about wild strawberry student movement. So it's not wild lily, but <laughs> wild strawberry. So uh, please join us in December. And uh, by the way, I would like to thank all the students and our you know, work colleagues, especially Nikki was here yesterday helping and today, but we didn't have the chance to thank him. Okay. <laughs> So we, we are grateful. Thank you very much. And do keep um, uh, watching and pay attention to our uh, website. Thank you very much for coming.